Thank you, Melissa. Good morning. This year in our uh, Gospels, we are usually in Mark or John, and we continue to follow Jesus' mission and ministry, this time directed towards Jerusalem, uh, where he has another interruption today. This time it's a rich, young ruler who has a, an important question, and um, talking about belief and what's necessary to attain the kingdom. And so it's, a, it's an interesting reading. It applies probably to everybody that we meet every day, the confusion they get in their own minds about what's necessary to inherit the kingdom. That's our focus today. Uh, the opening hymn is hymn number 901, Open Now Thy Gates of Beauty. We sing verses 1 through 3. Let's rise as we sing this hymn. Today we follow Divine Service Setting 2 on page 167 in your hymnal. It's also printed in your bulletin. We make our beginning in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We go to our Lord and confess our sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And before the general confession, let us take a moment and silently profess those sins that weigh on our heart heavily today. Let us confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God has given his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, to die for you and for me, and for his sake he forgives us all of our sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins. 
in the name of God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today's psalm is a portion of Psalm 90, verses 12 to 7. We read it 17. We read it responsibly. So teach us to number our days that we may present to you a heart of wisdom. You return, Lord. How long will it be? And be sorry for your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your graciousness, that we may sing for joy and rejoice all our days. Make us glad according to the days you have afflicted us, and the years we have seen evil. Let your work appear to your servants and your majesty to their children. May the kindness of the Lord our God be upon us and confirm for us the work of our hands. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. bulletin on page four at the middle you will find today's collect we gather our hearts together and pray this prayer let us pray Lord Jesus Christ lover of sinners have mercy on us bless all people that they may know your standard of goodness only you alone are good protect us from the deceitfulness of sin the tendency to fall away, and ultimately the single condemning sin of unbelief. By your grace, may people discover that you give away the inheritance of heaven. Look upon us in love, and trusting in your grace alone, empower us to give away all that we have to you and your purposes in our life. In your name we pray. Testament reading for today, the 20th Sunday after Pentecost, is from the book of Amos, the fifth chapter, sixth and seventh verse, and again starting at verse 10. Seek the Lord and live, lest he break out like fire in the house of Joseph, 
and it devour with none to quench for Bethel. O you who would turn justice to wormwood and cast down righteousness to the earth. They hate him who reproves in the gate and they abhor him who speaks the truth. Therefore, because you trample on the poor and you exact taxes of grain from him, you have built houses of hewn stone, but you shall not dwell in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, but you shall not drink their wine. For I know how many are your transgressions and how great are your sins. You who afflict the righteous, who take a bribe and turn aside the needy in the gate, therefore he who is prudent will keep silent in such a time, for it is an evil time. Seek good and not evil, that you may live. And so the Lord, the God of hosts, will be with you. As you have said, hate evil and love good and establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord, the God of hosts, will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. Joseph. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today's epistle reading comes from Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 through 19. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. As it is said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt led by Moses? And with them was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that we are unable to enter because of unbelief. This is the reading of the word. Speak to God. Please rise for the uh, verse of the day and our gospel reading. In your bulletin on page 5 at the top, you'll see the verse from Mark 10, verse 17, which is our focus today. And we join together and read this verse. As he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up to him and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do so that I may inherit eternal life? The Gospel for the 20th Sunday after Pentecost is recorded in Mark chapter 10, beginning at the 17th verse. Glory to you, Lord. As Jesus was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor and father your mother. And he said to him, Teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him. And he said to him, You lack one thing. Go and sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, Christ. 
Our sermon hymn today is hymn 915, Today Your Mercy Calls Us. We will sing verses 1 and 2. You may be. to you in peace from our good and gracious triune God who gives us his own goodness and who is our inheritance. Today as we follow along in the Gospel of Mark, we meet a conflicted man. This man is confident that Jesus has the answers to his questions, yet he leaves without really listening to him. He understands that God's kingdom is an inheritance, and yet he wants to do something in order to gain that inheritance. He believes that he has kept at least the second table of the law, which Jesus quotes today, loving your neighbor. Yet it's quite clear by the commandments about coveting that he has not, in fact, kept them. He kneels down before Jesus, honoring him as a good teacher, and yet he does not lie down prostrate before the God incarnate Lord of glory. As we think about this man who comes in genuine earnest and zeal, we are oftentimes very much like him. We are oftentimes conflicted. We know God's will. Oftentimes completely we know it, and yet we fail to follow through it. We believe in Christ, and yet our response is oftentimes weak or tepid or half-hearted, or maybe we don't actually follow what we know he would like us to do. We often want to bear good fruit, and we in fact do bear good fruit but because we're connected to him, but the fruit is probably not as ripe or as big as it could or should be. In spite of all of these shortcomings, Jesus looks at this man, and he looks at us. He loves him, and he loves us. So as we think about the context of this, we realize that Jesus, not only by looking at the man with love, but by speaking the truth in love, he is good. He really is what he questions a man about, do you really believe I am that good teacher? We find out that he proves to be so. We also remember that Jesus is on a big mission. We learned last week that his mission was to go to Jerusalem. The scriptures tell us he was setting his face to Jerusalem. It was not an easy task. Literally, it was uphill. Jerusalem was almost always uphill, no matter where you were going in Israel. And so not only was it metaphorically uphill, because he knew that this was going to be a heavy burden, literally, that he had to bear, but it was also geographically headed uphill. Jesus was going to be giving away his life. It was the most generous act. I call this a journey of generosity that he is on to give away his life for the world and in exchange take the world's sin. As I think about Jesus' journey, 
I realize that we too are on a journey and our life is just as epic in a way. We are to reflect the glory and the grace that he has given to us every day. The man who is on his own journey to get questions answered is really not sure about his own life. He doesn't really know what to do. And so he comes with this question that you heard before, a good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Lutherans quickly understand this as confusing law and gospel. The gospel is the good news. It's God's gift to us. We receive it. We don't do anything. It is by grace we're saved, not by works. You should know those things, especially as Lutherans. The law is about doing, and the gospel is about receiving what has been done. An inheritance is given, and a true inheritance cannot be manipulated in any way but it is strictly given by the one who has it to give. God has the inheritance. God is the inheritance. God gives the inheritance. So Jesus cuts to the heart of the matter very quickly. And the question he asked at the beginning of his verses about the law really is the heart of the matter. Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. Great King Solomon who uh, was far richer than this man, who is described as a wealthy man, uh, probably the wealthiest man on earth during his days, wrote in the book of Ecclesiastes a book about life, a book about a worldview, a book about faith. What about goodness? He said in Ecclesiastes 7.20, Indeed, there is not a righteous man on earth who continually does good and never sins. St. Paul, in another epic verse in Romans, a verse you probably know, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Jesus' take on it was the question today, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. So with this one question, Jesus immediately breaks down the aspirations that this man has of doing anything good to the back of our minds. We're thinking that's what he wants to do to inherit. He says, no one is good but God alone. Dr. James Veltz, who spoke here a few years ago, great Greek professor, wrote a fairly new commentary on Mark, says something very poignant about this particular dialogue between Jesus and the man. He says, Jesus has driven him to despair. Jesus wanted to drive the man to despair. To be hopeless in his own ability to do anything to get the inheritance. Despair is hopelessness. Now, he's not quite there at this point in the conversation, but he's going to be there at the end of the conversation. He's certainly beginning to think, while well, there are chinks in my good armor, my holiness, my self-righteousness. So to be hopeless is really not a bad thing if you're counting on saving yourself. Our one hope is God who is good. So the question is, wow, maybe I haven't come to the right man. Maybe this man is beginning to question Jesus and his own goodness, either as a good teacher or maybe he's not who he thought he was, a prophet of God. But we read in the Gospels that Jesus did claim to be good. A lot of people read that verse and they say, well, Jesus therefore denies his divinity. Huh. You may remember in John 10, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Now, in case you think that that's not quite sufficient or claim to be God, he's calling himself good, and he uses it here as a critique, an adjective that you can't use towards teacher, and he uses it towards shepherd. And you may remember the 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, and Jesus is claiming to be the good shepherd. Well, if you read on in John 10, you may also remember that he is actually going to be killed by the people listening to him. They pick up stones to stone him. Why? Because he also said, I and the Father are one, in that same context. There's no doubt that Jesus believed he was good and also believed that he was God, and he has that goodness to give away. So the next part of the dialogue is Jesus quoting what we call the second table of the law, 
those commandments that are about how we relate to each other, how we love our neighbor. For the most part, he goes sequential, but he switches the order and changes a word. So this is what he said. You know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud and honor your father and mother. So it is interesting that Jesus skips the entire first table of the law, that part of the law that is really most critical. Do you love God with everything you have? Luther would describe the meaning to the first commandment, have no other gods before me. Fear, love, and trust in God above all things. It is the one commandment that holds everything else up. Jesus didn't go there. He goes there at the end of his conversation. But at the beginning, he starts to talk about, well, let's break down this righteousness that you have. And so he quotes these. He also puts the fourth commandment about honoring your parents last, and then he changes a word in the ninth and tenth commandment about coveting to defraud. Not precisely sure why he puts the fourth commandment last, but we learn from the parallel companion gospel readings in Matthew and especially in Luke that the man is described in the same account in their gospel as being a ruler. Now, it is entirely possible that he may have eclipsed his parents in authority, in power, in honor in the Jewish community. And it may have had some influence upon whether or not he treated his parents as he should have always by honoring them. Maybe Jesus puts that last, as I believe he puts the coveting verses last, kind of his exclamation point, how are you doing in your heart? Your lifestyle may seem great, but what about your heart? But then he changes the word covet to defraud. And I think we can say something about that. I think he is saying to the man, have you had adequate care for your neighbor the way that I have empowered you to do? Defrauding is a word that can also be translated deprived. When you have a resource to help someone who is in need and you don't give that resource, and we believe that all of those resources ultimately come from God, you have deprived them. And so Jesus uses the word defraud. He's now planting the seed for this man's stewardship life, which apparently has been less than perfect, less than good. So then Jesus concludes by saying, there's one thing you lack. Go and sell all that you possess and give to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. Now the man is at the point of despair. Why? Because all that he had had really been his source of confidence and trust. That was his hope. That was his idol. That was his God. To take that away from him was a scary thing if you trust in that. Naked, you and I are going to go out of this earth. We don't take any of that stuff with us. So as we look at this man who turns and goes away, sadly, it looks like a complete desperate situation. But there's hope. Why? Because he's sad. He's actually listened and believed the words of Jesus. It's had an impact. What's far sadder is when people could care less about stewardship or they could care less about righteousness to know that Jesus is our righteousness. And they walk away and say, yeah, well, you can believe that. That's not what I believe. This has made an impact. The man has listened. But of course, he hasn't listened completely. Jesus ended this with an invitation. Come and follow me. He's not there yet. He's mulling that one over. I recently had a conversation with someone on campus about the concept of stewardship. And it actually led to a discussion about the current laws regarding uh, abortion, still an ongoing debate. And I went through some of my normal uh, statements about the way we see the subject and, and, and you know, 
they were supporting the fact that it was a woman's body. And I was saying, well, you know, physiologically, you know that's not really true. Different DNA, different blood supply, and half the time a different sex. So it's really not a debate about physiology, really, essentially, spiritually, it's about stewardship. It's about ownership, because that's what stewardship is. Stewardship is saying, I don't own it. And I forgot to quote those verses to this person. So I later emailed the verses that I will now quote to you. Psalm 24, 1. The earth is the Lord's and all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. It's not just the earth. It's those who dwell in it. They are his. And to stay with that good shepherd theme that we were starting earlier on, Psalm 100, verse 3, know that the Lord himself is God. It is he who has made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. God created us. He owns us, and then he bought us back on the cross, the scripture says. Do you know what the next two verses are in that psalm? Maybe not. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name, for the Lord is good. His loving kindness is everlasting and his faithfulness to all generations. Enter his gates. You see, that is the inheritance. You enter his gates with thanksgiving when you know that he owns you, when you know that you, he bought us back on the cross through Christ. You get to go through the gates, and of course Jesus said he is the gate, he is the door. And so you go through those gates with confidence, and that look of love from the eyes of Jesus had to have stayed with that man. How could Jesus say that I should give everything away when he looks at me with these deep loving eyes? because he is far more secure than any bank account we have. It's interesting, in my life and ministry, numerous times I've heard stories about bedside estate changes in families where somebody who's discontent or someone who doesn't trust their parents and their estate, when their parents have had a stroke or something else, they go in there and they get an unscrupulous attorney to write a new will, and then get it changed. It actually happened at my first church, where our church was disinherited. What are they trusting? They're trusting only in that, not in God. What it real boils down to is faith. They just don't believe that God can provide for them, and so they're going to provide for themselves whether it be self-righteousness to get to heaven or a bigger bank account to live on earth. Neither one works well. The writer of Hebrews, who is writing to an early church living between 30 A.D. and 70 A.D., before the temple was destroyed in 70 A.D. by the Romans, he's writing to a bunch of Christians who have left the Jewish faith and become Christian, and things are not easy for them. And so they're thinking about going back. You know, they were being persecuted by their own brethren. And they're wondering, is this really what it's all about? And so he uses the example of the people in the Old Testament, the people in the Exodus journey. And he tells them, look, they, they died in the wilderness because what? They were unable to enter the promised land because of their unbelief. It all boils down to belief. If you believe that Jesus is the one who gives the inheritance, and the inheritance is even beyond the grave, wow, that's pretty much got everything covered. Inheritors can now rest in that inheritance, in that identity that I am an inheritor. They don't need to try to please God in order to get the inheritance by faith, they have the inheritance. They please God because they are a good tree and they bear good fruit. God has changed their very nature. He himself lives in their heart. He is their inheritance. A lot of people forget that the Levites, one of the 12 tribes of Israel, the ones who are the priests, 
did not get an inheritance. They didn't get a section of the promised land. Why? God says, because I'm your inheritance. They were to be a picture of all believers in God. That's why we're called in the New Testament a priesthood of all believers. Our inheritance is Christ. Inheritors are free to give because if it's God's, you can't outgive God. And inheritors see the love of Christ directed at us coming from the cross and coming out of the empty tomb and saying, this is yours for free. Live in that security. You know, I never really connected the dots. But in Exodus 15, and if you look at the Exodus account, remember Exodus 12 is the Passover, the lamb dies in place of the people, God sees the blood, he passes over. The New Testament calls Christ our Passover. They're finally led out of Egypt. They're left enriched because the Egyptians just give them everything to get out of here. And then they're facing, again, the Sea of Reeds, sometimes called the Red Sea, and the Egyptian army behind them. You know the story. The Red Sea parts, they go through the sea, they come out on the other side, and they get to see their enemies drowned. I think that's a baptismal reference. What we sometimes forget is according to the timing, it is also an Easter reference. Passover, Good Friday, same day, same day in the calendar, the day after the Passover, after the Sabbath, is Easter Sunday. In the victory song in Exodus 15, you know what Moses told the people to sing? Thou wilt bring them and plant them at the mountain of thine inheritance. I think you can honestly say Moses understands that he is going to have the people planted in the resurrection. The inheritance is the resurrection. You're going to get everything. Forgiveness, life, salvation with God. So what this man who was learning about Jesus, he was learning that life is lived with the inheritance in our pocket, Christ in our heart. There's a potential romantic, theologically romantic, happy ending to the story. Mark is the only gospel writer who writes about this curious man in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's got a sheet on. He's unnamed. When they go to crap, grab him, they grab the sheet, and he runs away. And by the way, the sheet is described as a linen sheet. It was an expensive sheet, maybe a family sheet. Is it the same guy? Is it the guy who did, in fact, come back and follow Jesus? Could be. It's unanswered. And maybe it's unanswered because God wants us to answer that question in our own life. If everything is God's, we become his steward. Empowered, enriched, free, joyful inheritors. That's what this story is about. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which goes beyond what we understand, stand guard over our hearts and minds to keep us strong in faith in Christ, the giver of his goodness. Amen. We rise and we sing the last two verses of our sermon hymn. Today, your mercy calls us hymn 915, verses 3 and 4.
remember our inheritance as we profess our faith in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. This time we gather your offerings and prayers. There's an orange card in front of you. If you have a prayer request, fill it out, give it to the children. If it's a private prayer request, fill out the back side and drop it in the box as you leave today. Lord Jesus Christ, in the Psalms you say, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. You are the good teacher. You are the good shepherd. You laid down your life for the sheep who often wandered in weak faith or disobedience. And yet we look upon you and we see the eyes of your love looking back at us. We thank you, Lord, for your grace and for the free inheritance that you have richly bestowed upon us. May we live life as inheritors, believing your promises. In your name we pray, amen. Um, this is from Stephanie Halverson, a prayer request for a coworker who... Uh, is in the hospital, who's her, her boyfriend is in the hospital, I believe. Um, and um, we will pray for that person. Judy Franson is asking for prayers as she has not been feeling well. We pray for Jeannie. Um, some of you saw in my note home this week that our uh, refugee family, the Asylee family, the Chipinda family, Maria, has been having some pretty serious neurological issues and still they're undiagnosed. Uh, a lot of fatigue. Uh, by the way, if anybody uh, is free Tuesday at 11, uh, try to take a group of people over to meet Melvino Jr. to see if there's a way that we might be able to help out uh, with child care from time to time. 
Um, also, would like to remember uh, Diane Santana, who continues to uh, have testing uh, done and test results and visits with doctors uh, as they found some things in imaging. Um, and uh, Carla N. has completed her radiation. We're thankful for that. And Bob Peckins continues his chemo for one more uh, treatment. Uh, and so we're praying for these folks. Let's rise for these prayers and the Lord's Prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, as we live our life secure in the resurrection, we know, Lord, that you have, by your grace, planted the seed of faith in our heart. And we pray, Lord, for those who we have named, that they too would have the courage and confidence of Jesus giving us the inheritance. We pray for a co-worker of Stephanie Halverson, who uh, is in the hospital. We pray, Lord, that you would bless uh, that man, not only with healing according to your mercy and will, but also with uh, a knowledge of the confidence of Christ. We pray for Maria Chipenda, who has been having uh, a number of issues. Uh, her strength has been sapped. We pray for her strength and her healing according to your love and mercy. And we pray that we would respond as Christ would have us. We also ask, Lord, that you be with Jeannie Franson, who also uh, is, is complaining about uh, issues relating to health. We pray, Lord, that you would bless her with strength and healing according to your mercy. Uh, and if there is some issue that needs to be diagnosed, we pray that that would happen. We ask the same for Diane Santana, Lord, who's had a number of tests and still has uncertainties about the treatment plan. We pray for her as she goes through yet more testing uh, and more doctor's visits. We thank you, Lord, that Carla N. has finished her treatments and uh, now is at the next phase of her care. Give her wisdom and guidance as she takes that step. We pray for Bob Peckins, who will have um, more chemo soon, uh, but Lord willing, will be at the end of his treatment. We pray that your hand of healing would rest upon him, and we thank you for the many graces that he has received in this journey. We ask all these things in the name of Christ and pray his prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Any announcements as we leave to serve the Lord? Okay. Well, then let us go with his blessing and peace. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. Now thank we all our God.